before this, I was with Cambridge as the chief field officer. So yeah, I can't take any friendship from a travel to a So yeah, enjoy that. Cool. Hey, hi. Good evening. My name is Resh. I'm from Boos. Uh, I work for Product Team. I lead a Product Team that, uh, so in Boos, most of us know that as uh, e-wallet. Uh, but they also have another big use case. About a million of customers of Boos that use uh, Boos to pay their bills or top up. Right? So those products are under me. And uh, also, I'm involved in the buy now pay later product for Boos. And uh, yeah, before this, my experience is I have a own startup that for children marketplace uh, that I built and uh, and I also used to work for job street product uh, back then, right? So products is what my background and uh, love to share. Hi guys, uh, my name is Val. Uh, I'm from Beam. So Beam is the popular school as you see on the ground in Lloydway in the streets of KL. So that's us. Uh, I head a uh, product group at Beam and uh, basically look after like growing product and which is why this topic is closer to my heart. I've been in Malaysia for about six years, uh, work with different brands like Fame, Store Hub, Air Asia and now Beam. I'm from India and uh, engineering by degree but product person by profession throughout the field. So, nice to have a chat. Thanks, thanks for like I said offline, uh, you know. I feel a bit nervous now with the collective experience and diverse background that all of you are from. So please go easy on me. Yeah? You should go easy on us. Sure. <laughs> so um, you know, when we talk about consumer brands, uh, right? Uh, product like growth is more than a buzzword. You can talk about it. So let me start with this one. Let's say if somebody wants to get started with a product like growth, uh, what would be the present? How does one get started? You know, in terms of budgets, resources, whatever you want I mean, uh, first I think to really kickstart the product like well, you really need to have a product market fit, right? So if you don't have that, whatever the growth, whether you try to buy a product or web marketing is not going to really fit into the market, right? Uh, then uh, I would say once you fit a product with the market, I would say that you have to make sure that the users are okay because product like growth is actually a, a, a combination of teams, right? So there is marketing involved, there is product involved, Product. It will be coming from marketing, it will be coming from the data guys, it will be coming from 
but these three guys are already in there, right? But you need a lot more participation, right? To go into that one goal, right? So I think we have to speak more detail. I think the product driven is high level is you no longer building something that they say, hey, we managed to find a grant, let's build something after that six months. What do I do next? Right? So it has to be very much who's your customer, then from there we build products, right? So that's to be from boost and how I see uh transit. Right, yeah. So, so uh, just extending on the point that Kavi mentioned about OKRs, goals. So you spoke about multiple stakeholders being from data, marketing, product being involved in this. How how does the goals you know get distributed when you're handling or uh, working with multiple stakeholders? It's a very good point, right? So I think this is where I think you used to call uh, what is a North Star goal, right? Uh, so when you call North Star goal means uh, marketing focusing on maybe uh, retention or marketing focusing on only activation. Is that good enough? Or product just build another use cases. Is that good enough? There must be one single metrics at least put us together, right? Apart from the business goal. So there will be one matrix that three or four teams equally interested. So in that sense, I think you have a first of all you have to buy from a senior management at least one person to sponsor the idea, right? Who believe, believe in giving you the space to build as a team together. That is how it starts. After that, you get the marketing folks, product folks, and the data guys together to clearly crystallize the problem. Right? The problem is the most important to crystallize because solution is by natural return. Right? And, and that's how we will put together a team. Without a team, I think it would uh, move. Yes. I also want to add on, right? Uh, I think you are from product. Um, whereas I am sitting in a very unique uh, position, um, whilst I, I wear the hat of a head of marketing, um, customer insights sits within my platform, where you know we work very closely with customer analytic team. I'm also a product owner for quite a number of uh, airline product related because whilst I have got the access to the data as well as the customer insights, right? With that, I'm able to configure or even curate certain product based on certain behavior, which eventually I can then do it based on whether it is a disruptive product or whether it is a go-to-market, speed turnaround time, launch a market, and then after that, I come back. So, whilst I echo you, right, where you need to engage multiple stakeholders, so am I, um, in the sense that, you know, product owner, channel owner, market analytics, customer segment, as well as, you know, work with digital solution. In airline, we work with one more layer, which is um, revenue team. Revenue management team, where they will have to fare, they will have to file the fare, all right, according to the product that we want to go to market. So just to complement what you have just shared. Yep, uh, thanks, thanks. And uh, I think in fact, you also mentioned about you know, revenue being your primary goal. So how does that fit in with different stakeholders? That's a good question. So, um, you know, there are total of six mantras in Malaysia Airlines. Yeah? Um, number one, um, employee is our true north. And customer is our center of gravity. So a lot of things that we do, we press on these two key mantra. So having said that, um, revenue growth definitely is a key component for us to measure. But from an airline perspective, we measure three things, RFM, recency, frequency, and monetary. Yeah, I think, you know, these three has got the different parameters that we measure. And eventually, what we are looking is, what is the total stickiness of a customer? What is the lifetime value customer can stick with us? At the same time, you know, when we measure, it goes according to um, what is the percentage of accidental increase, how many times the customer fly with us, and what is the average order value that is actually engaged with Malaysia Airlines. So on that note, there are multiple different parameters when it comes to product as well as customer engagement. Fantastic. Fantastic. I, I think there is no better way to put that in together. Thank you so much for sharing. So, uh, what I'm, uh, let me segue into this. So, uh, when we talk about product led growth, right, adoption and onboarding plays a significant role to ensure that people are, you know, um, engaging with the product. So, what, what are some of the things that you would recommend for brands to consider if they want to drive 
better onboarding experience? I think that's a good question, right? So, um, see, onboarding, I was recently playing a game, right? I downloaded a random game uh, from the App Store because I was seeing an ad of a game on another game. And one thing that hit me very well was they asked me to sign in or do anything once I crossed 25 levels. And they said, oh, you have crossed 25 levels, uh, do you want to save your progress to sign in? That's a very, very small example of how, how a good onboarding experience can be better, right? So when I'm designing products, right, when I'm designing an onboarding experience, my objective is don't ask customer things that you don't need right now. You see a lot of apps which have like 20,000 things that they ask the customer when they try to find out. And uh, you know, it's just like jarring as a customer. You just want to try out the product. You just want to see the product, right? So with Beam, right, we see uh, like products for us, like attracting customers is not a problem. We deploy scooters on the ground and you know, customers are out there seeing our scooters and they will download the app. One of the biggest pain points that we are facing lately was customers have to add a payment method or add a card to take away. Whereas we give them two and a half million as credits, uh, in different markets, uh, sign up credits vary, uh, they have referral credits and everything. And we are more than happy to subsidize the first right of the customer. But how do we do that? Today, in our product, we couldn't start right without a payment method. So one of the new features which we are working on and launching is like, uh, we will allow our customers, as long as they are a new customer, to take a ride within 200 meters from where they started the ride. Right? So if they are a parking spot, they can go in the 200 meter radial, radial distance, travel for 10 minutes, so, so that they are not too far away from the destination and it's a free ride for them. And that gives them an understanding of how the product works, how the product experience works. So I think the key thing to consider here when an onboarding experience is considered is remove as many barriers as you can from the consumer, don't add don't ask too many things to the consumer unless you don't need them. Okay. Yeah. So uh, my takeaway is one, focus on letting them experience the product, reduce friction, and remove all the barriers that help you drive it off. Well, so um, I don't want to add something. I just wanted to add to what um, Varun has shared. Let me start here as an example, all right? Varun can, if you came from India, residing in Indonesia, all right? You, you, you handle my so you probably travel frequently in Peninsula, right? And you probably also go crossing to Sabah or Sarawak when you, when you want to expand your businesses. So from a customer data standpoint, Varun is a unique customer to us, all right? He fly on, perhaps you know during his business trip, he fly a lot. Perhaps he's on Malaysia Airlines, if it's not on Firefly. Yeah. Now, but when he goes on leisure, or rather when he goes back to India, perhaps his family is in India and Australia, alright? So this is where he come in as a leisure customer, whether he will choose Malaysia Airlines or any other full service carrier or even low cost carrier. So having to say that, Varun is a unique customer where he will travel with Malaysia Airlines or he will also travel with Firefly on the business and leisure. So on that note, right, if I were to dissect Varun as an individual customer, all right, it's very hard for me to break him whether he travel business or leisure because, you know, I carry two airlines and it's a single unique Varun that traveling on both airlines in a sense. So on that note, and I think even whether it is a product lab, at the end of the day, um, we have to use data as one of the insights for us to, to, to do our marketing and also analytics. But at the same time, it's important that look from outside in, where using Varun as an individual customer, how do we then create the RFM, recency, frequency, and monetary, having Varun to fly more with us and fly frequently with us. Fantastic. So I, I think one of the key points here is about uh, you know, bridging data. So even Ravi, uh, at the beginning, we spoke about uh, you know, multiple functions forming the overall notion of product and flow. We spoke about data, right? So how, how does data simplicity or what, what does brand can do? Uh, you know, take, take a data centric approach to be marketing, to be you know, product, or how does it fit in there? So, I mean, that's a, a very broad question on the data, right? So, uh, obviously, first to kind of actually democratize the data is, is a bit hard for any organization to do. Uh, it's just because you can't really give access to every single information to every single person in, in the company as well, right? But to, 
to kind of have the right data governance and right uh, data democratization is the first step. Okay, is the right people looking at the right data. Uh, and, and then there is behavioral data, and then there is transactional data, and then there is the data of combining that together and then uh, take, taking insights out of it. And transactional data is, I would say, some people don't like me, but it's pretty simple. Uh, you have uh, your airline systems or you have your other systems where you just download the data and then it's there. But behavioral data is where it gets tricky, right? I have to depend on the product guys, I have to depend on the tech guys to kind of make sure the events are firing on time. The right data is passing through for the right events and the right data is passing back into the database. Right? So, and then they, you have your marketing automation platforms, you have your web platforms, uh, analytics platforms, and, and all of that behavioral data is more valuable than transactional because what ends up in transactional is your conversion rate data, right? So let's say you have 100 customers coming in and your conversion rate is 5%. You have data of that 5% in the transactional. 95%? No, it's in behavior. Right? So to get that and uh, put it in a place, giving access to that people is a tough job, right? And then, then comes the analysis part and the insights part where you, know, you have a lot of good data mines sitting there and then figuring out, okay, what are we going to do with it? Are we going to come up with a good campaign around it? Are we going to build a new product around it? And then if you go into the advanced stages, then you're going to go with, okay, uh, I'm going to do an MVP. Uh, that culture has to be established. Otherwise, uh, what we call is a term called HIPPO, uh, highest paid individual's opinion. Right? So you just go with that rather than, uh, you know, looking at the data. Right? So yeah, it's a journey. Not everybody can get it right. It's, it's, uh, you have to put some effort into it. Yeah. Okay. So, Sanesh, you also mentioned about uh, you know, data being one of the pillars. Uh, so, what's your viewpoint? <coughs> Without data is opinion, right? So, all of us know. So, data is very powerful. I think as, as much as uh, I, I love data, it also can keep you being paralysis of information, right? So, one thing that down the line I realized actually. Having the pulse of your, your whatever you do, right? Whether it's, 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 it's data on transactional or data on users, I think having a data set uh, that you have a dashboard bare minimum is actually a must, right? Or else we are just swimming without a purpose, right? That's number one. But data is, is, is only 10% of what customers really uh, have a problem that they want to build next. You want to thinking about using data to build a product, I think there's only 10% of information you can get from data. But data can give you the symptoms, the signals, right? Hey, something is going down, right? That means something, somebody is stealing your customers. Or something transactionally not happening with the target that you have. So then you know some initiative is not giving you the uplift, right? Or the whole six months that you're building some product, you launch it, there's nothing is going, right? It's just another small stone on the ocean, right? So data is a single truth that you should be observing with an honest uh, view. You don't take it as a defense, you know, because that is the most truthful <laughs> information that you can get from anyone. You ask your friend, you say, very good, your product is brilliant, you're going to do it, right? But data is the only place that we land on to know whether whatever effort that we put have any uplift. So that goes to marketing, that goes to product by far. So having a data team, strong data team that believes in the outcome that you want to achieve is better than having a data team that just pull the track, uh, data for you for a report, right? So that's how we see it. But I, I think in terms of uh, privacy and information like data who can have access, I would say even as you don't have the access, you just need to know what you want to ask. Right? Having to know what information that you want to dissect or look for itself, I think is, is very good. Therefore, you can get that information from a data team. No data team will say, I'm not going to give it to you. It's just that you have to ask for access, nobody will give it to you. But if you know what you want, I think you should be able to get it. Right? So that will be my tips. I'm here 
in an example, back in 2021, uh, when borders opened, when we did, uh, when government opened up sandbox, all right, which is um, Langkawi as a sandbox of the destination, everybody was rushing and buying Langkawi as a destination for holiday. We see the spike, yep. right? And then subsequently, last year, April, international borders opened. We see another spike. Now, all this might tell us a lot of data. Whilst I, I agree with uh, Ravi, transactional data and also behavioral data, all right? In an error environment, whether it is a transactional data, we can always point it into a behavioral data. I share with you why. Customer who are booking Kuala Lumpur Langkawi is definitely a leisure market versus customer booking Kuala Lumpur to Singapore. It could be a mix of business, or visit friends and family, or it could be a leisure. But if let's say somebody is booking Kuala Lumpur to, um, to let's just say, Alosta, very high chance it is a Balik Kampung data. So we can always look at it and build our hypothesis, and then we do a product and subsequently test what exactly our hypothesis is right or wrong. So going back into the question about you know uh, product led uh, versus how do we do referral? And obviously referral program is very, very important to us. While at the end of the day, while we talk about cookie coming in 2024, 2025, all right, it is important for us to grow our first party data. From the first party data, growing it organically. If I have got Varun flying on Malaysia Airline, how do I get his family members? fly on me on Malaysia Airlines. I think that is a immediate, you know, organic data. If let us take yourself, Maria, you are only flying with us the first time. How do I get you to fly more with us? Again, this is where the RFM come in. So the referral program work on two. Number one, internal data. Second one is partnership with our partners, whether it is a financial institution, whether it could be working with Castle or even you know with micro mobility because we are only dropping or we are ferrying passenger point to point. But the minute when you landed at the destination, how do you then mobilize from one point to another? So I think the referral program comes into multiple vertical, internal and external. Thanks, thanks, thanks very much for that sharing. So uh, why don't we were discussing about this topic from backstage, you know, on chance of the AI. So what's your view on you know this generative AI uh, being charged with your others for the main things, you know, as part of the software. Uh, how does that fit in the overall product strategy? Or how can consumer brands leverage AI to drive, you know, their product strategies? I think AI is going to be the internet of the next decade. Like the last major revolution was internet and everything built around it, like mobile phones came in. I think AI is going to be the next one in the next one in the next decade. You know, like you're going to see crazy things happen again. Chat GPT, man, I'm a big fan. Like, uh, there's one tab of Chat GPT which is open in a window all the time. Like, it's it's small things. Like, if I'm writing an email, right, I would just put it in context and write the email for me, and then I edit it. Etc. So, it's like for me, it's like I've got a AI editor essentially at the end of the day who can do busy work for me and
And I think AI is there to assist and it's going to help us grow to the next level of the next level as a civilization overall as a, as a human being. So, pretty excited to see the next 10 years. I'm, I'm excited that I see this in my life. Like, <laughs>
it's gonna pay a big payment. So should I just do it because our partnership came in and we all should do it because it looks like Group is a good brand, do it? No. Because the question to ask is, is that growth in that project or is it a project that just another assignment that we're gonna do, right? So like that, we now in, in Boost make it such a way that those days you can say, oh, government grant coming, we need to invest six months of project or there is some initiative that we need to do because we committed to. So we decided to do, go away from that. We say, if really product driven or the entire company driving one metrics, one goal, then you have to have a pillar of decision making. Right? So the pillar of decision making is very clear. If this product, example, give us 10 million net revenue, then it falls under this quarter. Any initiative that you do, if you fall under this quarter, don't ask for approval, go ahead and do. This quadrant is user. If there's a 2 million active user can be grown from your initiative, go ahead and do because this is all under this quadrant. So I guess in any company, when you have a quadrant of decision making, you eventually can, we call it self-funding. Because it's already a team that we funded to go and hack it, right? So for just promotional driven, marketing driven, you invest on the margin. But anything to invest in product resources, or extra support resources, make sure the team or some level of guidance on what metrics that you guys are driving. Therefore, usually in a company like Boost, we call it self-funded uh, team. So that means we know clear metrics, this is where we invest. So we used to have about 64 different products that we built. Today we streamlined to three to four core products. And it takes a lot of discipline to do that because when you COVID time, everybody gets excited, right? Whatever we can do, <laughs> Because scan and pay, there's nobody using it, right? It's going to go out. So we just, so much of product, so much of noises in the app. Now we try to streamline. So when you streamline, you actually have more resources to play actually. So when you streamline, you have actually more resources to ask for marketing to focus on your product. Because today, in the, in the two years time, two years before, marketing is saying, oh, I have 10 people need to help. Who do I help? Do I have insurance? Do I have uh, scan and pay? Do I have loyalty, right? But when you streamline, in a company, you will start seeing the resources are also more, you get more resources actually. Resources is not money, right? It's resources actually from other teams who are supporting you, right? So I think those are the things that I will say during this kind of time, not just time in the, the economic uh, climate, is actually companies should be more compact and lean the way they put resources together. Therefore, the team that really need to grow, they will have more resources to support them, right? So that's how. We, we, we are trying to do that. Thanks, thanks. Probably anything you would like to add? Uh, I mean, the economic conditions are too macro for anybody to kind of control, right? So, uh, we've, even if before that, I usually use a simple framework called ICE, ICE. So, I have all the list of projects that I have, and then uh, we all rate it uh, to see, okay, uh, what would be the impact. It's just a mental exercise. How confident are you uh, that this in fact will happen uh, and how much effort you need to put in, right? So, and then I just take an average of that for all the projects and just prioritize what you know, the, the most uh, highest order basically. Yeah. So, at the end of the day, that's the framework that I use to prioritize, but we can't just do anything. If I have ample time, then yeah, I don't have any frameworks, just do everything. Right? Yeah. So, uh, but from a marketing standpoint, uh, you know, it's easier to measure some of these things. Maybe because we look from a broader sense of channels and say, and say, hey, okay, these are channels we can double down on those. But from a product lens, how do you prioritize? Or especially with this same kind of I think, like for example, I'll give you a context of that, right? So, uh, for us, the biggest markets are South Korea and ANC. That's where most of our uh, DVs are, DVs means vehicles are and uh, that's where most of the profit comes from. So I think our we are very clear in our focus, right? So everything that product team builds has to drive this one metric that we track uh, called PCD or ML dollars specifically. So it basically means the uh, revenue post operational cost, right? Mm -hmm. That's what we are trying to optimize for and that's what we try to charge. Right? So in our pro product scoring system, right, when we are featured first, we always try to estimate for that kind of metric. Like how much ever ever dollars is this product or project gonna uh, generate? Then there are other considerations as well, right? Uh, this quarter and the next one, we're making a lot of initiatives to uh, basically build a future parity with our competitors, right? Because 
Victoria is going to be a very much focused market. So it's, I think it's the balance of aligning between you know what your problems are, where do you act? If you know uh, you're doing well in one market, how do you replicate that success into another market where you see a lot of high potential? And being laser focused about those uh, those ideas and those executions and not falling astray. So Elven Dollar Metric help us be in line. And uh, anything which does not is not going to drive that particular metric, we don't really pick up. And uh, having a focus, very clear focus on which markets we want to uh, improve on, which areas we want to fix, uh, that gives us another line of balance. So I think these are the two major things that we use in general to uh, basically decide when we want to prioritize any future or any product or uh, something like that. So if I can go one step deeper into it and say, you spoke about uh, monopoly in the market, right? So how, how does this fit when you're building something for the local market and when you're building something for the global market or for a you know, larger region where the user experience and other things you know, could be a significant factor? See, I really, I wish every product that I built could be localized just by using the tool localized. Yes. Just translate it and it works in every market. That would be the ideal best for me. Uh, there are, of course, like there are contextual things that you have to do for different markets, right? Like as much as I want to cut down the steps out of onboarding, Korean government doesn't let me cut it down because they want the driver license to be verified for customer things. Right? And whereas in uh, Indonesia or Turkey, the governments are relaxed. So we have to balance a lot between government relations and uh, you know uh, what those local markets are. So for us it becomes slightly more tricky because Every country, every region we operate in, uh, like even within a region, right? DBKL is a bit more strict as compared to uh, the slang of the concept. I don't know the right word for it, but yeah. Uh, so far, we are not Malaysian. You get us some of the good ones. We have time to make last session. So basically, the idea is that for us, it's, it becomes slightly more uh, tough because we have assets on the ground on government's properties. and. Uh, so we have to do a lot of globalization, a lot of contextualization, and that is just part of the business and part of the game for us. Uh, however, we try to build our product in such a way that it's easily localizable. Uh, to give an understanding, we have an apps dashboard where every single function on the app can be turned on and off on a geo level. Yeah. So I can turn a function on and off for one player. Uh, example, you being able to add a MasterCard can be just for one year, based on your production. So we build a product in that way that you know we anytime we put anything out there, if a new market wants to use it, they can. Uh, but we have the control, we have the ability to just put it out for one market. That's how the entire product architecture is structured. So yeah. So uh, here's one idea uh, to the audience. I think back then we were talking about uh, all things under the sun. Uh, so we gave an idea about the shortage of OTT content in Malaysia. So any of you working on a product or you know, interested can build a product on translation, localizing, and uh, yeah, so you can get the right Excuse me. Yeah, cool. So uh, let me, let, now let's summarize this, right? So uh, what are the top three things that you look at on a daily basis to say that, hey, yes, things are moving in the right direction? Okay, okay. So I have a dashboard set up. Uh, which is a bunch of behavioral data dashboards. Uh, these are basically health metrics, which I want them to look the same they were looking yesterday when I wake up. I don't want them to move too much. If they go too high, I'm also scared that something wrong happened. If they go too low, I'm also scared something wrong happened. Right? So that's that's one basically just like, okay, you're there. You should be there. You should stay like that. Uh, dashboard that I look at every day. Uh, second thing is uh, essentially Look for any red flags or any issues that happen, right? So uh, whenever we launch a new product like this, of course, uh, a specific deep dive into that particular product that happened. So you look at look at those numbers. So I think these are the primary two things I look at the first thing in the morning when I start the day, and rest is lost between meetings and Slack messages and you know, focus on thoughts. So why one? What would be your three things that you do on a daily basis? To be honest with you, um, there are multiple, you know, in, in, in the day-to-day, -day, but 
apart from the revenue that we are looking at, all right, customer segmentation, stickiness, um, autopilot, a lot of use cases are very important, in which it helps us to drive um, better yield versus a lot more tacticals in the market. And the third one is obviously um, we think global and we act local, um, especially where we look at you know all the global market, um, which I like to cite an example, a use case. I like to use India for today's discussion for some strange reason. Okay, so for for, for India, okay, um, the, the passengers. Three million the line tickets coming on the way. India. <laughs> Nations that they look at Bali and Phuket. Do you know why? Visa upon arrival is far more easy as compared to coming to Kuala Lumpur. So on that note, a lot of honeymooners like to choose Bali and Phuket as their destinations. Malaysia, yes. Kuala Lumpur, yes. All right, but it's become a second choice because of the G2G um, relationship where the visa arrival. Now, India market is very really unique, especially when they are in a honeymoon, they like to come to Malaysia, they like to go to Bali and Phuket. As they have got children, they are going to travel, they will then choose ASEAN. Because India market is a three generation travelers. The parents, themselves, and the children. And they cannot go further because they need to make sure they stretch the dollar. Again, ASEAN become their primary destinations. Uh, a preferred choice. As they grow older, they send their children to Australia to study, right? Australia become their destination for the silver hand category. So you see from a life cycle perspective of a passenger in India, it's very different. And this localizing marketing strategy can never work in Malaysia because it's a different passenger, different behavior, different target audience. Hence, allow me to repeat, while we think global, but act very, very differently in the local market. Whatever the marketing strategy for India market versus UK market versus Singapore market, totally different because it's all based on the customer behavior and also segment. Why can't likes India actually? I have a feeling. Why can't likes India or not? I'm sure. <laughs> and just to add on, uh, uh, passengers from North India and South India, different travel behavior. I'm sure you know, when you look at the data and you look at the passion, you'll find some other passion that you know, people from Kathleen India or you know, around the rest of the area or the rest of Malaysia. Yeah, I understand you. Uh, Ravi, what about you or Suresh, who have the mind ready? Top three things to look at on a daily basis. Sure. Um, no, I think just to touch on the, the data, right? Uh, I just think that you sounded like a Malaysian Indian. We also slash our money and go to South Asia. But again, it's so opinion, right? Data driven, whatever feedback she gave, she be more trusted than our opinions. Yes. Um, right, so back to me, right? So I think uh, I'm obsessed with data. So I think I get data being scheduled to send from 4 o'clock in the morning to 4 30, and I gotta wait for 9 45 to the main dashboard to be refreshed. So I will get the to see the number looks same almost I mean, almost most of the days, I always get surprises, right? Uh, the surprise is what keeps you on the toes, right? So simple. Because sometimes you think everything is okay, uh, but the sound matrix is, is not, right? And, uh, and that's where my role is to, uh, because hacking the growth is not easy. Because if you want one person, two person growth, I think that's not a growth, right? We're talking about 10, 20, double, 2, 3, x one shot. All kind of growth demand that we are trying to push for any new ideas should grow that kind of scale. Therefore, you shouldn't grow a little bit, right? So you want that graph to be either going up or don't want to go down for sure, but not going anywhere, right? Now you know the initiative is not going down. So data by by trend is what I will see first. The other one that normal routine is uh, because most of the time we have uh, uh, new innovation products that in hand that require range for me. Right? Those kind of things that we invest a lot of uh, uh, in boost so that we create the next levers. So sometimes uh, in, 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 in boost product, I think we normally don't see a horizon beyond 6-12 months because as 
I said, if I have any idea, nine months time that I want to build, uh, the great thing is why can't I build now? It is important, yeah. right? So therefore, anything that you give a horizon beyond that, that means you are just putting it on a good map. Anything you put in the next six months it should be your core focus. And when you focus deeper, I think there's a lot of work to be done, right? Whether you know, in validating, uh, in doing some research, and talking to customers. So those are the things that will keep you busy uh, in my role. Uh, but yeah, start with it. Thanks, Ravi. So I think uh, what I look at daily is something I really uh, take a lot of time to take that decision because as leaders, what you measure changes the behaviors of your team. Right? So what you measure really matters, not just for yourself, but for your team behaves. Or you're, oh, I'm on an AU and your team doesn't really care about the bottom line, so they just look at everything. And so uh, uh, we have the normal cash flows, but uh, what we Automated is if any slight difference that comes out of the normal matrix, uh, we automate it to, uh, to get a bot message in our chat platforms so that, okay, events broke, there is a spike, or something happened. Those are the messages I really care about rather than a normal things uh, because that's the ones everybody should pay attention to. Right? So other than that, if I define my top three, everybody cares about the top three. I just don't define the top three. Fantastic, fantastic. So if I can summarize, uh, based on the conversation, thank you so much for you know, you know, sharing the wealth of knowledge uh, with us. A, for uh, an effective project growth, focus on not just product, but other pillars, other supporting functions, be it marketing, be it group, be it data. Uh, in terms of metrics, don't just look at revenue, go beyond the, you know, revenue and look at other metrics that are leading indicators. Uh, in the current age, especially, you know, acquisition is something that all of us focus on, but customer engagement and retention plays a significant role. So, focus on retention. Uh, next point is look for red flags, right? While we are glued on things that are working on really well, look for things or look for signs that are, uh, that probably need attention and, you know, well, both, 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 both,